All right, fellas. Today we are going to start chapter 17, uh, which is all about uh, how a uh, gene inside of a chromosome eventually becomes uh, or or is uh, transcribed, translated and transcribed into a protein. Now, um, in this particular uh, case, essentially, um, you have to realize that the uh, code for a protein is found in the genes in the uh, very specific sequence of the nucleotides, the adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and, and the order in which those nucleotides appear in that given gene. Uh, remember that that order, that sequence, is inherited from your parents. Um, and so the parents, the proteins rather that your parents produce are the same as the proteins that you produce. Right? And this is true in all organisms um, that uh, reproduce, um, well, in all organisms, period. Um, and so it's the DNA that uh, leads to your given traits, why you look the way you do, why you have the blood type you have, and that sort of thing. And it's, of course, the proteins that then have the direct link between the genotype, your DNA sequence, and the phenotype, which is the proteins that you produce. Now, uh, the example that you see here is that of an albino raccoon. All right, now this raccoon has, um, it looks like actually it might be the, the female, it looks bigger than the rest, so it might be the mother. But in any event, the genes that make the albino uh, raccoon an albino are, were passed on from its parents, whether it was dominant, recessive, in this case, definitely a recessive trait. Um, and that is what we call here in the previous slide, gene expression. All right, the, the genes that, that the that white raccoon has uh, directs its protein synthesis, and it does so in two different stages. Now, what we'll do now is talk about what those stages actually are in uh, section 17.1. The genes specify proteins via two processes, transcription and translation. Now, uh, the first question we have to ask ourselves is how did how was this relationship originally discovered? The, the relationship between the genes that you carry and the proteins that you produce. In um, the year uh, 1902, um, Joe Garrett first suggested that it was the genes that dictate what you look like. And it does so because of the enzymes that you produce. And so he, he saw the connection between the genes that you carry and the enzymes that you make. And so he assumed that anybody who was uh, stricken with an inherited or genetic disease um, had that disease because of their inability to produce certain kinds of enzymes. Um, and of course, this all goes back to what we learned about metabolic pathways and how one enzyme typically produces the next and the next and the next. <clears throat> so there were uh, other scientists who were very important in uh, elucidating this process. Beetle and Tatum were the first uh, ones. They uh, did an experiment where they exposed uh, neurospora, uh, which is a form of, you, you're, you know, the green bread mold, if you leave a, a loaf of bread out too long. That's what we're talking about here. And they su uh, submitted these uh, bread molds to radiation and created mutants. Now the mutants themselves were unable to survive on mini minimal media, uh, media meaning the food source that they have. And so uh, then their, their colleagues, um, I don't know how to pronounce that guy's name, Serb and Horowitz, um, identified three different mutants. Um, and they were all what we call arginine deficient mutants, meaning that they couldn't produce the um, amino acid arginine. And they figured that each one of them had to lack an enzyme that was necessary for making arginine. And the experiments of Beetle and Tatum and Serb and Horowitz led to the idea of the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, which essentially states that the job of each gene is to produce a specific enzyme. 
Now, the experiments themselves uh, started like this. You place a bunch of uh, bread mold on um, a Petri dish with a uh, complete medium, every, any resource that they need, and you subject them to x-rays. The surviving cells, which are, might be mutated or might not be, uh, form colonies. You then would take those colonies and you would place them in different uh, test tubes with minimal media. So there wasn't really enough uh, food. And that way we could identify the nutritional mutants. The nutritional mutants were then placed in vials uh, with a, a variety of different media. And you can see the media listed here. Um, minimal medium plus valine, minimal medium, minimal medium plus lysine, and minimal medium plus arginine. And then of course, obviously, as in all scientific experiments, we have to have um, the control group, um, which grew. Now notice, the, all the vials were observed for growth, and whoops, uh, these two, the control and the one with arginine, both showed growth. That means that they were able to produce the, the arginine. Now, this is, is uh, another experiment, the second set. This is Serb and, and Horowitz's experiments. And so they had elucidated that there was a, an enzyme pathway. You start with the precursor molecules. Using enzyme A, we produce ornithine. Enzyme B turns that into citrulline. And enzyme C turns that into arginine. And arginine is what's necessary for the growth of the uh, bread mold. The wild type obviously can survive in any medium with any of these additions. But the class one mutants, the first type of mutant, um, if they had ornithine, they could go, all right? And, and of course, citrulline, they could go, and arginine, they can eventually produce the uh, arginine. This is representative of the control. The, the class two mutants uh, could only survive if you added citrulline there, all right? If you just added ornithine, they couldn't grow. If you added citrulline or arginine, obviously there was growth. And then finally, the class class three mutants could only grow if there was arginine in their um, uh, in their media. Now, if you look at the table below here, um, if the wild type obviously is going to live by the original um, set of enzyme or the enzyme pathway here, but what they elucidated was that um, class one mutants. If they had ornithine, they could then go through the rest of the pathway to produce arginine. Uh, class two mutants, uh, if if you gave them the precursors, because they um, they had uh, the citrulline, if they had citrulline, they could grow. But if they only had ornithine, they couldn't. And then finally, the last ones could only grow if you gave them the arginine, because they couldn't get past that. And so, um, darn it, uh, class. Class one mutants were missing enzyme A, class two mutants were missing enzyme B, and class three mutants were missing enzyme C, meaning that there was a mutation of some sort there. Okay, so later on it was realized that not all uh, proteins are actually enzymes. And so scientists over the course of the few years after uh, Beetle and Tatum and Serb and Horowitz um, revised the hypothesis to one gene, one protein. Um, and even that has been revised recently in that many proteins are made of many or a couple of polypeptides and each of the polypeptides is, is uh, coded for by its own gene. And so now we refer to Beetle and Tatum's hypothesis as the one gene, one polypeptide. So it went from one, uh, one gene, one enzyme, to one gene, one protein, to one gene, one polypeptide, okay? Um, okay, and that's where I will end this video. Remember that there's a second one coming up on transcription and translation.